And now, from the great state of Mississauga in Ontario, Canada, it's the Ted Wallachin Podcast. Brought to you by Tom's Place, for the finest in men's fashion. Tom's Place will suit you. And ETP Canada, providing a state administration with ease. ETP Canada. And now, here's Ted. Hey, thanks so much, Becky Coles, and thank you all for joining us. I'm Ted Walsh, and welcome to another episode of the Ted Walsh Podcast. My special guest this week has been described as an outlier, a dreamer, a wise entrepreneur, and most often, an undeniable lover of radio. John Paul is the president and co-founder of MBC Media. That stands for My Broadcasting Corporation. Currently, they operate or will be operating, according to the CRTC when they approve, 23 radio stations across 14 markets in Ontario. We're talking middle and small markets. Recently, they purchased four stations from Bell Media in Kingston and Brockville. Now, in addition, he and his founding partner, Andrew Dixon, were the first Canadians to be granted a U.S. radio license when the FCC approved their application to purchase WLYK-FM in Cape Vincent, New York. John Paul joins me now. John, how are you? I'm doing great. Congratulations. It's uh, 20 years now since uh, you made the big leap into the ownership part of your life. And, uh, and, I, and I think to myself, I was thinking to myself, Gee, you know, if you look forward from 20 years ago, would you have imagined what the landscape could have looked like, the radio landscape in this country? <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, my youngest son, or my oldest son, I guess, he just turned 20. So he, he kind of marks the progression of our company. And uh, he just turned 20. And I, I looked at him and thought, man, I would have never thought he would be like this. And I think to your point, if you if I looked back then to now, now to the next 20 years, um, I think it will be like many things in broadcasting. There will be lots of changes, but I think the core elements of what we do will still be the same. The platforms and the delivery methods and how people receive it might change, but I think the that core thing of what we do as broadcasters will still be the same. I find it I find it really interesting, and some people have pointed out it, it seems that much of this uh, negativism is coming from former uh, members of the, the the radio club, as we like to call it. Uh, who think that radio is dead. Nobody's listening to radio anymore. Nobody cares about radio. Radio is meaningless. Young kids don't listen to radio. And yet you look statistically, and um, the numbers uh, are not as damaged as one might suggest. They may not be as powerful as back in the days of Wally Crowder, where you, where you owned the world, mm -hmm. uh, but there's the pie has been split into so many different pieces. Radio, in my opinion, will always be with us, but it just won't look the same as it did 20 years ago, and it won't yeah. in 20 years from now. Yeah, and I agree. I think the, the challenge with radio uh, is, as an industry, where we've failed is we always measure ourselves against stuff. Like, it's always like we do ratings, and then we say, well, this station's good, and that station's not good. When you're a business owner, though, um, None of that matters. The only thing that matters as a business owner is how great am I at serving my customers? Mm -hmm. How Ted serves his customers is none of my business. Um, I mean, I can learn from it. There's things I can pull from it. But Ted and I really are in competition because at the end of the day, my bank account is my bank account and Ted's is his and we're responsible for those things. So I think one of the things that radio has always struggled with is we've always been compared to other things. We always get looped in this competition. And when you look at the really successful radio stations and whether it's stations or owner groups or operators, when you actually dig down and talk to them, they don't really listen to any of that. They just go, hey, I've got customers, uh, whether they're listeners or advertisers that I have to get a result for. And if I'm doing that, there's more than enough of them in the world. I don't need them all. Uh, and radio has always been judged like we either have all the listeners and we're great or we don't and we're not great. When in reality... A station like TSN, uh, you know, sports radio, it, it, it might not look great in the ratings, but it might have this great group of rabbit fans that will show up at a bar 
and that will you know go to a soccer game which yeah. chfi doesn't have that power with a big audience but chfi has a different power um and they shouldn't be measured the same because one's a chinese food restaurant and one's mcdonald's and exactly. they you know like they're both restaurants they both serve people but how you operate them and treat your your customers are two totally different things so um i never really worry about those stories of uh you know radio is not competing against spotify uh, no. I mean, it is in the sense that people listen and stuff and they consume stuff, but Spotify is just the new eight track cassette CD record. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. um, and it's cooler than all of those things. But I saw an interesting stat the other day that blew my mind that record sales like LP record sales are now getting close to where they used to be. Um, like they almost fell off a cliff and went nowhere. And now they're like back in the billions of dollars. And that blew my mind. So I think it just comes back down to like, if you have something that people like. Um, you know, I, I always found it quite amazing having discussions with people in, 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 in the sales departments of the radio stations that I worked at over the years, where they always looked at, well, these numbers show this and, you know, we can't sell this because we don't have this number, these numbers. And then you would run into a client who would buy the station without looking at the numbers and not caring about the numbers at all. It's just that this station feels like my business feels. Mm -hmm. It sounds like my customers sound. It listens to my customers and it talks like my customers. So I'm signing up with you. I don't care if you have, if your cube is this and the guy across the street's cube is 10% higher. I don't care. Well, and look, the, the business math of radio, um, I always laughed because we get caught up in these cube numbers and all these things that really don't matter because the average store, whether it's a shoe store or grocery store or car dealer, it doesn't matter. They can't accommodate all of our listeners, whether I'm a good station or a bad station. If every listener of my radio station walked into your store tomorrow, you'd close. You can't handle them all. So you only need such a finite percentage of our overall listeners to do business with you to return a very good return on your investment um, that like, like if you're in Toronto, like I don't need all of News Talk 1010's listeners to come see me. I just need three, four, five a day. And that math is still very viable to make work with a good radio schedule, with good creative, with a, you know, a good show that's promoting it. Um, and connecting like, hey, this business feels like my radio station and those those audiences mix. If you do that, it's, it's still a great business. Uh, and I mean, again, I experience that every single day across the province. So let me go back to um, my original point where uh, uh, this discussion was that there are the the naysayers who say, no, forget about it. Don't talk about radio because it's over. It's, it's, it's history. It's, it's gone. It's gone. And then you get the big corporations, as we saw recently, Bell Media, selling off 45 radio stations and saying things like, well, it's uh, it's just the business is not, it, it's you, you can't do it anymore. It's, it's just mm -hmm. it's not it's, it's not reality anymore. Well, and, and then just the other day, the same company, different person, spokesperson, the president for Bell Media said that the company sold 45 of their stations to, quote, committed local players it felt were, quote, better homes. Mm -hmm. You bought a bunch of those stations. Yes. Uh, are you a better home? Um, without sounding uh, negative towards Bell Media, yeah, I am. And, <laughs> you know, I think the I think the difference what's 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 never going back um in radio like if we talk about the old guys that go oh, it ain't what it used to be here's what it used to be if we're being brutally honest it used to be easier like it used to just be a lot easier like um announcers didn't need to know as much stuff because there wasn't social media and there wasn't text boards and there wasn't uh you know uh facebook or uh, all the different things that exist now so like the job was just go in and get behind a mic and introduce a record well that was a lot easier now it's a lot more than that and in fact that might be the least important part of it um what was also easier and this is never discussed was selling the medium like in the big markets 
Um, selling radio used to be pretty easy. You stood by your fax machine and McDonald's sent you an order. And then a salesperson grabbed that order and went into the sales manager and goes, look what I just sold McDonald's. When in reality, yeah. all they did is went to the fax machine. Um, and I, again, I'm, I'm oversimplifying that. I know there was you know, salespeople that actually went out and did really hard things, but that was still the bulk of their business. That's not true today. Uh, the majority of our business is I know the guy that owns a local meat shop or I know the guy that owns a local used car dealership or fry truck or whatever it is, and they're buying the medium. And that takes work. Like you got to go out and meet those people. You got to go out and have a relationship with them. And the trend that I've seen specifically when I look at uh, big companies, whether it be Bell Media or Rogers or Chorus, um, is their sales departments are, are, are literally small percentages of what they used to be. Because somewhere in the mix, they thought, hey, if we got rid of some of those people that went out and did that hard work, we'll save money there, but we'll still have these free orders coming in and it will all work out great. Um, and the problem is it hasn't. So yeah. you have radio stations that uh, return really good audiences. Like their audiences aren't the problem. Their programming's not the problem. They just don't have enough salespeople out talking about the medium. And Kingston, which is one of the markets we've purchased from Bell, like someone at a university should do a study of it because it's it's one of the few markets in Canada where it's it's only represented by Bell, Chorus and Rogers. There is no independent owner. Mm -hmm. But when there were independent owners, the market did much better. And that market, when compared to other markets across the country where there is an independent owner. So like Peterborough is a very comparable uh, market to um, to Kingston. Uh, the market does a lot more revenue because there's a guy like me or whoever it might be pushing the product of sales, rising the tide of radio in the marketplace. And when you look at Kingston, if you just do simple math, pretend you're not even smart at business and you just go to Chorus and Rogers and Bell and you figure out how many sales reps they have collectively out selling radio every day in a city of 120,000 people, they have less than I have in you know, Renfrew population 8,500. And right. then when they go, well, how come my results aren't as good? They default to what they know, which is Google, Facebook, all these people taking our, you know, a slice of the pie. When in reality, they just don't have enough feet on the ground. Um, and I can give you a real world example. I, I, I had a market recently when people want to sell radio stations, I, I they come to me because I'm a buyer and uh, I had a very rare situation where I had both operators in the same market uh, were for sale. And one was a big corporate and the other was not. And the other one that was not a big corporate did six times the revenue of the corporate station. Hmm. So, so in that market, you'll have one operator saying, wow, radio's dead. And the other market's going, God, I'm making tons of money. What's the fundamental difference between the two? It's how they operate. It's one has news people and salespeople and doing all the things that fundamentally we know have made radio successful for years. And the other one has very few people and in, you know, they're phoning in a lot of their product and don't have manager in the building, don't have a sales manager in the building. Um, so I think, again, just from where I sit, I think the fundamental biggest problem in radio is the big operators, and it's the same in Canada as it is in the United States, is they've tried to make the business easy, mm -hmm. where it's like, hey, I'm going to go sell McDonald's a gazillion dollars and put it on all these radio stations, and one rep will make that call, and it'll be easy. Well, the problem with it is there's only one McDonald's, right? Yeah. <laughs> if you if you yeah. win, great. If you lose, well, what are you going to do? Um, whereas when you walk down the streets of a Kingston or a Brockville or, or a Renfrew or wherever, there's tons of local businesses that they're looking for someone to help them. They're looking for a way to be connected to the community. They want to be involved in that promotion where you raise money for the hospital, because like you said, it fits their business. Yeah. And my observation again, and this would be in North America, whether it's an iHeart, a Cumulus, a Bell, a Roger, I think they've just, um, they, they haven't done that work. And that's the one thing fundamentally that will not go back. It's not going back to being easier. It's going to be more difficult. The great news about it is, you know, Ted, you know this. We work in radio. It's not that hard. <laughs> We're not doing brain surgery here. <laughs> that, but you have that's to show why we do it. Put in the work.
It, would, it, would it be fair to say that the, one of the big problems w- with corporate owners is that they can't relate to local communities because they sit in, in a big city somewhere and, and the guy who's in charge of a Bell or a Chorus or Rogers or whatever, he has no idea what's going on in Renfrew or in Peterborough or in Lindsay or or in Guelph or Mildmay or wherever, wherever it happens wherever, to yeah. be. Yeah, I mean, again, I, and I think I think radio gets tarred with this brush, but I think you would find that, um, you know, we see we we see what's happened in radio. It already happened in newspapers. Like one of the reasons Metroland struggled, and I'm a I'm a big uh, guy that's been in the the Metroland experiment because they're in a lot of my markets, yeah. and you know when they went from a guy or a gal that owned the newspaper down the street to what they became that they weren't even the same business anymore other than you'd call them a newspaper because when the owner operator was there they were at every event they were part of the chamber of commerce um, they were writing really important stories and what they became in the metroland was disconnected nobody knew who worked there and you know they you just send in a press release and they put it in the paper there was no journalism to it um, and radio's done that. And look, it's happening in car dealerships. It's happening, you know, anywhere where people are con- people doing these conglomerates. Um, you know, we see it in some car dealerships where like a, an old car dealership guy used to own it was part of everything. Um, you know, it was a big part of the community, really wanted to be the car dealer in the community. And, mm-hmm. you know, a big company from Toronto buys 10 of them. And now all of a sudden they're like, oh, no, we just need to be open. Well, no, you don't just need to be open. That's that's never worked in business. No, like, you, you need to have your name on it. You need to have your name on the local soccer team's jersey. Hundred percent. And these things are not difficult. No, they're not hard. Um, you know, I did a big study, Ted, of because um, uh, we got offered some some newspapers to buy. So I studied newspapers, and newspapers and radio are very much the same. There's a lot of really successful newspapers in Canada. Like, there's one down the street from me here that does great revenue per year, makes great money, um, or you have a Metroland that's upside down. Those are the kind of the two that exist. And radio's kind of the same. And when I studied all the all the radio groups I've seen over the years for sale, all of the ones we operate, all of the newspapers I, I investigated, all of the successful ones do four things every year. Every one of them. They do four things every year. They have a sales strategy that incorporates those four things. They have a community focus that incorporates those four things and their entire staff work on those four things. And I've just come to the realization that if you do those four things, you'll be successful, whether you are a country station, a rock station, an AM station. And if you do none of them, you won't be. (laughs) And my observation is I've seen some of these big guys, um, the stations sound great. They're well programmed. They have all the bloops and blaps and fancy talking, and but they miss the, they're missing the heart and soul of those four things of being involved in the community and being a leader and you know knowing your customers and all those things. I grew up in Toronto and in listening to um, the big influences of my life when before I started radio, where um, Chum was probably the biggest one. Chum AM, mm-hmm. uh, and one of my first jobs that I got was working in Peterborough for Checks Radio. Yeah. And I remember moving to Peterborough and thinking to myself, okay, here I am in Peterborough. I can get in my car and drive to work up to hip, up in Television Hill there. And on my way there, I can tune in to Chum AM and I can tune into 680. Why would anybody want to tune into me here in Peterborough when they can listen to Terry Steele or Roger Ashby or, mm-hmm. or any, any, any of the big names? And then it took me a while, but then it, then it dawned on me. It's well, because... They're not talking about what's going on in Shemong Boulevard, and they're not yep. talking about the Peterborough Pete's, and they're not talking about what's going on with the, the, the big fall festival that's coming up. They're not relating to the people who that live next door to the place that I'm renting, but I am. And the people that live next door to the place I'm renting are thrilled that, hey, look at look who's living next door to us. It's the guy who's on Czech radio. Yep. And he can talk about us and I can mention their name. And Terry Steele isn't going to mention your name or mention anything about the courses. Well, again, to your point, um, you know, uh, a listener probably did listen to 1050 Chum and they probably yeah, did they listen did. to CR to Terry, CFTR. What they were expecting from them was different from what they were expecting from you. Right. And yeah. um, we've researched our audiences across the province, Ted, for 20 years. And that's 
19 markets, different formats, different size of populations. We do it every year, twice a year, and the results are always the same. They have been for 20 years. When we ask the question, why do you listen to 96.1 MyFM? The order has been the same for 20 years. Number one, local news. Number two, the music. Number three, the contests and promotions. And number four, the announcers. And the announcers, I always say, like, don't be mad you're number four because you play an integral part of one, two, and three. Um, but And then we, we deliver our information in that exact same order. That is the priority. Local news is a priority. So if you're the jock on the air, your instruction is to say, hey, while you could talk about American Idol once in a while, that would be cool. But 1050 Chum is doing that and they're doing it better than us. So what you need to talk about is the Peterborough Peets, because even if you're not as good as 1050 Chum, you're doing it and they're not. Yeah. (laughs) And again, that's again, I want to say it's like this big secret uh, thing that we have going here that makes us successful, but it's not, it's, we ask the audience what they want. They say they want local news. We make sure we have lots of it. And, and that's I why I don't understand why, why, why whoever was at Bell that said that, 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 that small stations are not viable anymore. What I'm thinking like, well, what's the difference between now and, and, and 20 years ago? I mean, Peterborough radio stations managed to survive in the shadow of 680 and in the mm-hmm. shadow of, of 1050 Chum because they were dealing with the community. Nobody, yep. you know, shut them out. They're still there and that situation still exists. And those markets still exist with those radio stations because they are servicing the community yeah well look it's no different than any business like you know i laughed because somebody said why would you buy a radio station in 2024 i'm like why would you buy anything in 2024 <laughs> why, why, why would you buy a shoe store i can buy shoes online why would you yeah. buy a car dealership you know I, electric cars are going to take over the answer is you would do it because there's a business model there's a community that will support you there's businesses that will support you and you think there's a path forward um and you know, I see that in, in these markets. And quite frankly, like, um, you know, I look at a market like Kingston and I'm like, it's underperforming. Like, even if we can get it, you know, a little bit better, we're going to, we're going to do really well. And, um, you know, we've got 20 years of buying stations from all different types of broadcasters and making them more successful. So until I buy a radio station, don't make it more successful, I'm very positive on radio. And again, when I look at the financials of other independent operators that are looking to retire or whatever, they're doing a great job. They have great businesses. You know, the biggest problem that I think we have in in the microcosm of the world right now is, you know, I don't know who I sell it to. And a bigger problem for that is I don't know who my local shoe store, I don't know who takes over that because the next generation isn't as excited about grinding out business as the previous generations um, because, you know, the phones made everything easier, right? Like um, I could be on OnlyFans and make $3 million a year and you go, well, that doesn't really make any sense to me, but it's hard (laughs) to argue. Yeah. (laughs) I I don't know. I know. Oh, I, and you could make three million. I couldn't make three million. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know. You know. What's interesting is is that uh, where where you really where you really tell the importance of uh, where it's really underlying the importance of local radio and local media is when disaster hits. Mm-hmm. Because when there's when there's a, a a major fire that breaks out in a community or or, or inclement weather or an event happens. Nobody handles that story like the community yeah. radio station or the community newspaper because the big cities they're not going to they don't care about it. It's no. it's not a big deal to them. No, it's and you know deal. it's interesting too. Like I mean, we've made the case to the commission CRTC um, many times where we'll say you know like Renfrew's a good example. We would say you know Ottawa stations are big. Oh, there shouldn't be a radio station in Renfrew. We serve Renfrew. Uh, Cause we're 45 minutes down the road and we're like, yeah, but you only serve Renfrew when there's a negative story. That's someone right. It's murdered a fire. Someone dies. Like what about the 99 amazing stories that are happening every day? The little girl that raised money uh, for a friend who had cancer. Like what about that story? Cause that, that's a better story. Um, so like, I, I think like going back to the local news um, and what you pointed out, like a business wanting to fit with a radio station, like, I don't know where I live. I like the things that make me, you know, 
resemble where I live. Like I like my burger joint. I like the bar I go to. I like, you know, I like buying from the same couple car dealers. Um, I don't, I don't want it generic, <laughs> you know? Um, and even I think it, like I used to tell people when I lived in Toronto, they never believed me, but I said, you know, if you live in Toronto with, you know, you millions of people, when you get into your little microcosm of where you live, you know, you kind of go to the same grocery store and, you know, you get on the subway every day and you kind of see the same people because they're going to work at about the same time. And mm-hmm. like, it's not the same as a small town, but it's not that much different. It's no. really not. Um, and if you can tap into that and whether it's, you know, radio in Toronto is a bit different because they tap into people with music, right? Like Chum F- Chum FM's famous for playing pop hits and Q107's classic rock. So that's really the thing that grabs people. Um, and then they sprinkle in some Toronto stuff that, you know, the Leafs and stuff that is generically large enough. Whereas we're kind of the opposite. We're, we're hyper specific. Um, you know, yeah, we're playing those same songs, but like Taylor Swift doesn't sing any better on CHFI than she does on my FM. What's mm-hmm. different is when she's done, you know, we're going to talk about something that, you know, Ted as someone who lives in Toronto, you're going to say, what in the hell are they talking about? Um, whereas if you live here, you're going to be like, oh, I'm glad they told me that I want to do that tomorrow. Right. Um, so we're just, you know, again, it's, it, it's like the Chinese food restaurant and McDonald's. Um, if you, if you figure out what your audience is and you just go and super serve them, you can be successful at whatever it is you're doing. Ted Wallison returns in a moment. I've had the great fortune to say that I've been associated with one of Toronto's finest names in men's clothing for more than 25 years. Tom's Place. Founded by Tom Mahalik's father in 1958, Tom's Place offers brand name men's apparel at unbeatable prices. But more than that, they boast a long-serving, knowledgeable, and friendly staff that can assist you whether you're looking for casual or formal attire. And they have plenty of first-class tailors on site. In addition, Tom and his family are well known for their philanthropic work. So if you're looking to deal with great people who can fulfill your clothing desires at outstanding prices, do yourself a favor and visit Tom's Place. They're open weekdays from 11 to 6, Saturdays 10 to 5, and Sundays noon to 5. You'll find Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Or check them out online at toms-place.com. Tom's Place will suit you. Have you been tasked with the role of a state executor or expected maybe in the future you will be? Well, if so, let me make your life a lot simpler by introducing you to my friend Debbie Stanley. Debbie is the founder of ETP Canada. They specialize in estate administration. Their goal simply is to help Canadian executors understand their role and how to deal with a loved one's estate. Let's face it, there's no school for this, but ETP Canada offers services such as executor support, estate accounting, and they have a new online course called Executor Ready. It's an engaging video designed to make estate administration easier and affordable, and those are two comforting thoughts during a stressful time. So call Debbie Stanley at one 866 309-0387, that's one 309 387 or you can get her at info at etpcanada.ca, that's info at etpcanada.ca. Now back to Ted Wallachan. What are you planning on doing with the, with your two new stations, in, or your stations, I should, not, not two new stations, but your stations in two new markets, being Brockville and Kingston? Look, I'm super excited. Um, you know, Brockville is a wonderful market. Um, and, and, you know, Bell to their credit has, you know, they have good radio stations and they're well built. There's nothing wrong with them per se. Um, they, they just need, they, they, they need a hug is what they need. Ted. Mm-hmm. They need someone to just go in and hug the staff and, um, say to the staff, like, here's where we're going. Right. This is the other thing that's harder in a, in a big company is getting everybody on the same page because, you know, at Bell, they have 50 different businesses they are really running. So like when the boss comes into town, you know, he's not necessarily passionate or she's not necessarily passionate about one thing. I'm only passionate about one thing, and that's radio in that market. Right. And, um, you know, so our strength is we give them a real clear direction of here's what kick and butt looks like. Let's go there. And then we give them the tools and resources to do that. It's going to be the same in both markets. And my observation right now, not being, you know, we're not working there yet because it hasn't been approved by the commission, um, is my number one observation is they need a hug. 
they need some direction, they need support and resources, and they probably need more people and they need leadership. And again, I'm not, you know, crapping on the leadership at Bell. Uh, my definition of leadership is that person has to live in Kingston. Yeah. And that person has to live in Brockville and the general manager of the radio station needs to understand that when the Kingston Frontenacs are in game seven and it's all on the line that we need to be there cheering them on. Yeah. And we need to show everyone we're there cheering them on because they're our team. And if it's in Brockville and it's a Brockville Braves or Royals or whichever team it is, right? It's the same thing. And you need someone leading that charge that rallies the team and says, guys, this is important. We need to not only be there, but we need to own it. Um, and then we, if it's important enough to own, it's probably over, over, important enough to have a few sponsors and you, you just build it all bigger. So that, that'll be the biggest change. Now, let, let me take, take, take a look at this from a, a little bit of a different angle from, from the standpoint of, of, of staff. As an owner of a radio station, when people apply to you for, for, for work, are you looking at, A, the, the amount of experience they have, and B, are you looking at their age at all? And when I say that, I, I say that for two reasons. Number one, there's an awful lot of people who have lost their jobs in radio, in let's just say in Toronto, in the last five or ten years, mm -hmm. not because they couldn't do what they could do. They could do whatever they were doing. They were doing it really well. But they got to a point that they've been there for so long, even at 2.5% raise every year, you're mm -hmm. making too much money, buddy. Sorry, you're not you're not getting 120 grand anymore. I'm turfing your butt, and I'm going to grab somebody for 45 grand. How do you look at that? What what is your perspective on that? Are you willing to uh, to hire? Are you hiring people who used to be in the big markets and who still want to do the job but can't get a job in a big market because of their money? Um, the the answer isn't yes or no. Um, here's my observation: in in the eighties and early nineties, small market radio had a problem that um, they didn't want people to stay. So, like when you went out to Peterborough. They wanted you to come in there for a few years and they would teach you some stuff. And then they kind of wanted you to leave because they couldn't afford to keep paying you more money. So Ted, to make more money, would, you know, pack up his family and move to Toronto where he'd make a lot more money. Um, and, and the business model of small market radio used to be that, God, when people stay, the problem is I end up spending way more on them because I keep giving them these raises. So I kind of need the young people to come in and leave. And then I'll bring in more young people and train them and they can leave. And that kind of, they be kind of, that kind of became like the farm system for the big markets. Um, that all changed probably 18 to 22 years ago when automation came in and you could, you know, do a lot more things technically yeah. than you can do now. Um, and I have found over the last 20 years, that our best staff are the people that kind of walk in and go, Hey, I'd, I'd like to work here. And we train them and we show them our systems and we show them our um, culture because what we found over the years is uh, our strength is we started in 2004. So we don't have records. We don't have carts. We don't have CDs. Um, we also don't have any, you know, we used to do, we, this is the way we do it because we just started doing it the way we did it in 2004 based on the technology we had. Um, and when we've hired people from other stations, um, unless they are, unless they are just eyes wide open and eager to learn, they struggle because our culture is so different than what they're used to. Like our culture in, in, in a small market, like, so in Renfrew here, um, you know, population 8,500, keep in mind it is our head office as well. You know, we have, I think 15, to 16 staff um, and those 15 and 16 staff do a lot of things they do news they do you know morning shows they do afternoon shows they sell radio they do a lot of things but you know i'm the owner and i come in and i take out the garbage and i've worked with announcers that you know would come from toronto they like, i don't take out the garbage no no you didn't take out the garbage <laughs> at mix 99.9 .9, but at my fm we all take out the garbage because when it's full we take yeah. it out like it's you know so it's it's a different environment um, that said, we have a lot of, um, you know, we have a lot of people that have worked for other big, you know, it's Steve Gregory, who is on CFTR for years and was a you know, big afternoon drive guy in Ottawa for many years. He works for us. Um, you know, Melanie Martin, who used to do the morning show at Flow, 
uh, in in Toronto. She works for us. We have a lot of you know. Uh, Kim Geddes is our news consultant. She does a fabulous job for us. Yeah. Um, so, like the short answer is, yeah, we do. Sometimes we find the the, the personality struggles more because, and again, we're we're so technologically driven um, that it's a bit different. But again, it depends on the person. If the person's got the right attitude, we can show them how to do everything. Um, but it is, it's not like it used to be where you put an ad up on the, you know, whatever milkman or whatever. And some guy from Saskatchewan or Toronto would be like, Oh, I want to move to Pembroke because my mom lives there and I'll come and tear up the town. Um, and it's not like that anymore because we've built our business the opposite way, which is we try, we've built our business to keep people as long as we can. So, um, my business isn't like, I got to ship people out. My business is I've got to train them and show them how our business works so that they can add more to it. And um, I think we've done a pretty good job at that. We've got, a, you know, um, I'm super proud. We've got people here that they started out as a co-op student in high school. And, you know, now there are gen- general managers for us. Yeah. You know, we've got people that started in news and now they're sales managers, like, because they've learned you know, that we don't have these silos of news programming and that we're, we're everything. We got to be able to do everything um, because that's what it takes in the small market. And that's what you just answered. My second question is what do you tell somebody who is in community college right now, who is thinking of radio and is hearing these negative uh, uh, opinions from people who are saying uh, radio is dead, radio is dying, but they still believe that radio is still alive and they want to be part of it. How do you prepare them? Do you tell them pretty much get ready to do everything? Yeah, well, look, this is what I tell schools. I, I go speak at Algonquin College, and I always walk up to the front of the room, and I'll tell them, like, guys, do you want me to give you the sugar-coated, John's a nice guy, raw, raw speech, or do you want me to give you, like, the real speech? And, of course, they always put up there, give me the real speech. I'm like, okay, remember, you asked for it. Here's the real speech. Get ready to work hard, because you have an opportunity that Ted Wallace didn't have and that John Paul didn't have, which is Ted needed checks and Peter World to hire him. John Paul needed you know, whoever to hire me, which is hard to believe they hired either one of us, but they did. <laughs> and then we had to stay there and grow and all that kind of stuff. You don't have to do that. You can go build a community, a podcast, a Twitch following. Like you can do all of the stuff that we grinded out in small markets. You can do it tonight in your dorm room, but you have to do it. And you can suck at it for a year and have no listeners and have no followers, but get better at it. And do a million interviews and have a lot of them be terrible because they have to be to be good. And a lot of young people today, they don't want to put in the work. And um, and I don't know that maybe my generation was the same. And I was the guy that loved putting in the work because I absolutely loved radio and I couldn't get enough of it. And I would stay longer and learn from people like Ed and uh, listen to other stations and make notes. And like I was consumed with it. I did the work. I'm not that like there's nothing really special about me other than that and you know guys like ted or wally crowder they did the work like i used to always laugh in the hallways of news talk 1010 the really the old cfrb when you went down the hallways they had pictures on the wall and one of the pictures and you have to think about this to realize how monster it is was wally crowder broadcasting live from a curling bond spiel in huntsville yeah in like 1961 now in Like, think of like the drive from Toronto to Huntsville in 1961. It is not what it is today. And to set up and broadcast live in 1961 is a major commitment. Mm -hmm. And that guy was at a curling bond spiel. I can't think of a less important event. (laughs) (laughs) Like when you think of all the things News Talk 1010 has covered over the years, but he did it. He put in the work. And that's why Wally was so loved. Because everyone would be like, I met him at a curling bond spiel. Right. Um, and, and so that so I look at young people today and I'm like, it's easier for you than it's ever been because you can you have the tech. Like we didn't have a radio station in our home anymore, like back then. But everybody does now. Like my kids, who my oldest is 20, they walk into the radio station and into the studio and they go, my phone does all this. And they're yeah. right. It does. Yeah, yeah. So it's hard to explain to them why it's exciting. But when you and I walked into a studio and you had to play records into carts, you actually needed a technical skill uh, as well as being a good communicator, right? You don't need that anymore. Now you just need to be a good communicator because yeah. the technology part's really quite easy. So I tell the kids, like, get good at communicating. Say hi to everyone. 
Go over and talk to someone you've never met. Um, join a club that you have no interest in. Learn something. Do a podcast every night. Do TikTok videos. Because when you become, like, the world wants great communicators. It's always been the case. Um, so I think I think it's a great opportunity. Speaking of podcasts, I mean, that is an opportunity for people to uh, to play radio, if you mm-hmm. want to put it in, in, in that case. If you're just in college and you can't, you know, you're not eligible for a job yet because you're still studying. Uh, and so you can you can you can start your own podcast and you start interviewing people or playing music or whatever whatever it is you want to do. Playing music is a different thing as the rights and all that. That's a different story. Mm-hmm. But how does how does the world of podcasting and the world and your world of radio how do they do they intersect? Do you see them intersecting? Uh, you know, I, I think for a lot of times broadcasters felt they did. Um, I'm not so sure anymore. I think we're. I, I mean, again the word podcast is so um, generic, like what you're doing here, like long form interviews um, is different than like the best of, you know, John Moore in the morning in eight minutes. Right. Yeah. Like, but what's nice about that for the radio station is if someone really likes John Moore, which there are millions that do um, if they miss something, they can get it. Whereas in the old days you couldn't, Um, you know, and I think one of the things that, you know, Howard Stern should get a lot of credit for is he was smart enough to have all those archives of all his shows because there are millions of people that, you know, they love those bits and they, they can access them now through him and Phil Hendry's the same and Bubba the Love Sponge was smart. But like, you know, you know, Jesse and Gene, for example, who were big, big morning show I used to listen to in Toronto um, or Humble and Fred, um, you know, there was no best of Wally Crowder anymore. Like I can't go and access the show, whereas now you can. So I think archiving wise for radio, it's great. I think it's great for um, a guy like John Moore or, you know, John Oakley, any of these guys that are amazing interviewers, you know, they can, they could do a 40 minute interview and then just play the best two or three minutes on their show. uh, And then just tell people, you want to hear the whole thing, like go listen to it. So I, I think for that, it's great. But I think like what you're doing compared to, radio I, I think you can be very successful in what you're doing um and it doesn't have to have anything to do with radio that's what's kind of nice about it is it's it, it's a it's a blank canvas yeah well the great thing about it is 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 doing long form versus doing i mean i mean i, I appreciate doing this so much more than i did appreciate appreciated doing the sh- here's four minutes you got five minutes you got the premier of ontario that's it you give me five minutes of the premier of ontario yeah and now you know you want to take 35 minutes you get 35 minutes with the premiers of ontario because you can do it you don't have the, the there's no walls closing in on you however there are two distinct talents there doing the three minute interview and getting as much information into that is in some cases tougher than doing a 35 minute interview on the other hand a lot of people can do a three-minute interview, but after three minutes, their brains shut down and they can't stretch that into 25 or 30 minutes. Yeah. Well, and again, that's, I think that's one of the reasons a lot of podcasts no one listens to um, because they just, the, the, you know, the person's learning it. It's, it's not as easy like a, every real estate agent goes, I should do a podcast about buying homes. And I'm like, yeah, okay, you could do that. But who wants to listen to it? <laughs> like, it's, not, it's not everybody. Like you're now not competing with, you know, Oprah, because you're not, you know, you're competing with like Oprah's assistant's assistant who's doing a podcast. Um, but what's interesting to me is um, I look at podcasts and I look at streamers because I, I, my sons were all into video games. So I, I spent a lot of time learning about streamers and, you know, I've had this conversation with broadcasters and they all look at me like I'm insane, but I, I believe it to be true. And I believe that if a News Talk 1010 did it or a CJD 800 or an AM 640, CBC, somebody did this, they would be very successful. Streamers are successful because they do this. They stream playing video games for eight hours. So for eight hours, they stream themselves playing video games and they talk to their chat and, you know, they make jokes and whatever they do. Then they have an editor and the editor comes along and says, I'm going to take the best 10 minutes, like out of eight hours. And the 10 minutes is going to go on YouTube. And that YouTube video is going to get viewed a million times. And it's going to make us, you know, 3,500 bucks or whatever the mechanics are. But then out of the YouTube video, we're going to take the best one minute and we're going to put that on Instagram. And the best 30 seconds are going to go on TikTok. And literally they're, they're doing kind of radio in reverse. 
they're saying like, hey, let me go wild for eight hours. Like imagine putting, you know, Pete and Geets or, you know, Roger Ashby or whoever the big radio guys, let, let them talk for eight hours. You're going to find some gold. The difference is, like, I remember I used to always, uh, you know, radio guys judge each other all the time. Like, you listen to a morning show, you're like, guys, the bit's over. Move on, right? <laughs> uh, go, you know, like, move on to the next thing. You're beating the dead horse. The streamers can do it because where they make their money is in the edit. And they take the edit and the edit, they, the, the people that watch it on YouTube, which is a different audience again, they never complain because they didn't realize they 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 beat it six ways from Sunday. So um, I think there's some things radio can learn. Um, I, I'm still amazed how few really good TikToks and really good YouTube channels radio stations have because I th- I think uh, it could be a lot better. Again, our you know our markets we're not prime for it because our markets aren't big enough, um, and you know we're so local news driven that. You know, in a market like Renfrew, they explain the news to you is not complicated. I don't need 30 minutes, um, you know, yeah. but uh, if I was a big station and if I if I owned iHearts and I have owned, uh, you know, choruses and Rogers, I'd be looking at my big talent going, we're going to partner on this. Um, you know, we're going to provide all the infrastructure. And, you know, when we put that video up on YouTube, you're going to make 70. I'm going to make 30. Um, and I'm going to show you how to do it. And, you know, maybe one day you go off on your own, but if I provide the structure and the, you know, make you a star and get you on hockey night in Canada and get you here, there, and, you know, I'm going to use all the resources I have. I think we can make you a star faster. Um, and I think there's a really good partnership that way that you could do. So I, I, again, I think it's a blank page and you could do a lot of really cool things. Well, it's interesting to watch uh, as, as, as time marches by and my God, it marches by way too quickly. Uh, all the changes that, that have happened, some of them are good. Some of them aren't good, but we learn each step we take. And as you learn, and that's one of the great things about getting old, because as you know, John, getting old is not a lot of great things about getting old, but one of the great yeah. things about getting old is you learn something every day and boy, every day you're just that much smarter. And, and if you keep thinking of it that way, then what you produce should be that much better. I always laugh because, you know, I, I, I love the old radio guys that are like, oh, radio is not like it used to be on 1050 Chum or whatever, right? <laughs> and I always go, yeah, but here's what you don't, here's what's never actually said. So I'll say it. Uh, because I used to work in the studio and I've had the carts and get to introduce the songs and it was a shit ton of fun. Like it was fun to work that orchestra. Yeah. yeah. But, and, and the audience on the other side was a, they were, they were a hostage. They had no choice but to listen to John Paul, whether I was good or bad, because they didn't really have that many other options. That's right. So when I look at it today, I go, you know what? To be fair today, the music programming on radio is better today than it was because it's researched and the rotations are tighter and you don't have a guy that comes in late after partying and goes, I'm not playing that song. I'm playing this one because I like it better. Like it's actually programmed more for the audience. Um, and no, it's not as fun as it used to be. Like that was, a, I feel bad for radio people that don't get to experience the love of running your own board with carts and pulling commercials and all. Like that's what was fun about it. Um, but I think the product of radio um, is maybe better today on a lot of the elements of how broadcasting is done. It is better. Like the broadcasters today are really good. Um, we're just mad because they didn't get to do it the fun way we got to do it. Um, and, you know, we also got, we also had a lot more control. Like we picked the songs we wanted and, you know, the, yeah, we had a liner card, but you know, I kind of forgot it and did my own thing. And like <laughs> now everyone's paying attention. Everything's mon, everything's measured. Uh, streams are measured. So you, you can't get away with the stuff we got away with, but if we're being honest, sometimes we weren't that good. <laughs> no, we were just having fun. No, so, it's true. True. There's that. <laughs> It's true. I mean, you know, we, we used to have cards. I remember when I used to work at Q107, we'd have to, you'd, you'd play, this is what you had. You had a D1, an A2, an A3, and a D1 was like an oldies, an A1 was like a top yeah. five currently, and A2 was a, a top 10 currently, right? So you'd go, okay, and the next one is, and you go, uh, Bee Gees, Jive Talking. Ah, we play that too much. We just move that to the back and pull the next one, right? So you weren't really playing by the rules at all, yeah. even though everybody thought you were playing by the rules or technically you were, but you weren't. No. But you're right. You can't do that now. 
Well, and also like the information um, was different. Like, you know, in the 80s, you could come on and go, hey, sunshine and a high of 20 today. It's going to be a hot one out there. And people love that information because they had no other way to find the weather when they were driving in their car. You know, if I just did that today, people would be like, who cares? Like, I, I already have the weather. It's on my phone. I already knew that, John. Tell me something I don't know. Uh, you know, so it is like to find that information. And again, not every jock is, I mean, not every jock anywhere has ever been great, but I think there's still a lot of really good radio. Um, I think, I, I do believe that um, the loss of the slates and the waters families yeah, and like the, the big, the big families that really, um, you know, when you talk to those people, they really love the business. And, you know, again, whether they were the best at it or not the best at it, yeah, we can debate all that all day long. But they, they had radio cared. in their blood. They cared. And they, they you know, and I, like I used to say to people like, um, you know, when I worked at News Talk 1010, uh, and I think people thought I was joking, but I wasn't. Like in the last bunch of years I worked at News Talk 1010, they had a big poster up on the wall of uh, TSN. And it was TSN. And it was Phil Kessel was the star in the picture. And I could never understand why it was still up. And I, I'd say, the guys, why do we have that up? Like, who's in charge of that poster? And they'd all go, why does it matter? I'm like, here's why it matters. Phil Kessel doesn't play for the Toronto Maple Leafs and hasn't <laughs> for years. And if Gary Slate was here, yeah, he would have pulled it down himself the minute Kessel got traded because it didn't represent the brand. Yeah. And the other thing is, like, I know the Waters families. I, I thought it was interesting, Jim Waters... Uh, who is a big hockey guy in the OHL now happened to be talking to one of our OHL broadcasters from Niagara. And I, I love the way he phrased it because they were talking. He said, I heard you guys bought my stations because he used to run Kingston and Brockville. Right. And that just warmed my heart so much that he still views them as his stations because right. that's how I view them. I view that they've had a temporary owner in between and we're going to bring them back and care about them as much as he did. So that someday when I'm his age and I'm doing whatever, someone I can say, hey, you guys own my stations and I love what you're doing with them. I, you, you know, I want to make those guys proud that that work they put in with their family is like because they cared about those markets and, um, you know, they cared about their people. and They did a really good job. Um, you know, they made a lot of money, so. I don't feel too bad for them, but uh. <laughs> I don't want to steal a lot more of your time. But I just do want to point this out because you, you you bring some to my to my mind. Dave Vigar was one of the greatest newscasters I've ever worked with in, in my years in radio. And Agreed. when he when he resigned from retired, I should say from from CFRB, they named the newsroom after him, the Dave Vigar yes. newsroom. Uh, years later, uh, Bell came came in. They bought the station and. Um, Several years after that, decimated the news. The news room just they literally em emptied it. Just threw everybody out of the street, and there was no newsroom anymore. Igar was so pissed off that he called the station and he said, "Take down that sign with my name on it. Yeah. I don't, do not want that to be called the Dave Agar newsroom anymore." Talk about taking it personally. Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, you know, I think I echo your sentiments exactly. You won't find a guy more dedicated to local news than than Dave. In fact, someone might argue he was too dedicated. Like sometimes, like, dial it down, Dave. Like dial it down. But he cared, and like again, that's the passion. Um, yeah. That I love, Ted. Before yeah. we go, can I tell you my favorite uh, thing that I stole from you? Because I did. I've I've stolen something from you. Oh, go ahead. As I long as it's not line. money. No, no. I use this line all the time. One one day on News Talk 1010, or it was a CFRB at that time, I think it was just at the time you were kind of, you were still doing commentaries on the mix. And maybe you were coming back, like like um, you hadn't started doing the morning show on News Talk 1010 yet. It was, you were doing right. weekends. Right. Because I think I, I used to deal with Mark Cullen. I, I do Mark Cullen show. And then maybe you took over at noon or something. But you had a yes. line you used once and I used it all the time. You're talking to this caller and the caller called up and he was talking about whatever. And you kind of very nicely interrupted him. And you said the following, you said, you know, that's really good, but this conversation's kind of more like a conversation we'd have if we were having a beer and I'm doing a radio show. <laughs> and that always <laughs> stuck with me. And I'll get in conversations now where people will get off track and I'll be like, that sounds great. That's a conversation we'd have if we were having a beer though. Let's keep talking about what we're talking about right now. So I want to thank you because I stole that line. I don't even know if you know you said it. You um, you could have it. You yeah. can have it. It's it's but all I, yours. I, I interrupt people with that all the time. That sounds like something we'd say we we're having a beer.
Yeah. We're not having a beer right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's been a real pleasure chatting with you, John. I wish you all the best. And um, I'm, I'm glad to see that there are people such as yourself that are in there saving uh, the stations that, uh, that so many of us grew up working on and crafting and working our craft on. Because if it wasn't for Peterborough's and Lindsay's and places like that, people wouldn't have a chance to get to markets like Toronto. And unfortunately, too many of those markets are being ignored by people coming out of college and going right into big markets where they don't belong. Well, you know, that's perhaps another story. Yeah. And I appreciate that. And I do want to just say that, um, you know, one of the challenges in corporate radio, I think is, um, there's a disconnect that all corporate radio might be the evil empire. Uh, and I just want to really say there are so many amazing people that work at the bells and the Rogers and the choruses. And yeah. they are just superstars in what they do, whether they're in Toronto or, or Peterborough or, or chorus. Like I, I can tell you that one of the things I'm super excited about when it comes specifically to Kingston and uh, to Brockville is the people that are there. Like they're my kind of people. They, they get local radio. You listen to those morning shows. They do a tremendous show. Um, they just need a few more resources. And, you know, again, I, I, I have nothing but respect for all those broadcasters um, because, again, they just they just need a hug. They just need a high five. They need a, you know, a news guy to come in and do the news once in a while. And they just need a few resources that will really make even what they're doing even better. So uh, I'm a big fan of radio all across the country. And I know there are millions and millions of fans. Uh, and if my story helps inspire somebody to, you know, rekindle their love, that's, that's all I can ask. Cause it's, it's a great business. Um, and it's a great business because of the people. Well, there's a connection that exists between people in smaller markets that doesn't exist in big cities. And that's the same kind of connection that, that the radio station that succeeds provides. And, and by that, I mean that you can live in the city of Toronto and you can have neighbors on your right side and your left side of your house and never know their names, never mm-hmm. mind having lunch with them, but move to a smaller market. Chances are you've been to their house or chances are you're going to their house tomorrow for a barbecue. And yeah. that's the way that big, small radio stations and mid mid markets and smaller markets think. One of the most exciting moments of my life um, that I saw happen time and time again was you know, when I was working at CFRB, when it was at to St. Clair, I get into a cab, whatever crazy time of morning to be wherever for whatever crazy shift. And when I told them I was going to to St. Clair Avenue West, their questions were, they, there was only ever three questions I got asked time and time again. Do you know Wally Crowder? Have you met Ed Needham? And what's Andy Barry really like? <laughs> and it always stuck with me that didn't matter what cab I got into, didn't matter what company, didn't matter where the driver was from, didn't matter who they were, man, woman, old guy, young guy, you know, from another country guy, didn't matter. They all had the same questions. And that always stuck with me that, you know, man, these guys on the radio, um, they've got these hardcore fans, people that like, they were excited to meet me because I might know them. And I, that always stuck with me that that's the power of, of radio and great communicators that, you know, they have that power to inspire people and, you know, make theater of the mind and all that kind of good stuff. So, um, I, again, I just, I, I just love it. I can't talk. About I met, it. I met a guy, um, through, through, a, through a family member. I was, I needed some car repair work done and I went, went to see when he's a Polish guy. And he said to me, he says, I got to tell you something. He says, when I came to this country 20 years ago, I learned to speak English listening to you on your radio station, CFRB. <laughs> Isn't that great, though? It's 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 the, it's the God's truth. It's it's yeah. true. No, and you you hear these stories, and again, I like I tell the story. Like I was I was doing talk shows on News Talk ten ten three or four years ago, and I'd be on at like ten o'clock at night, like in the middle of nowhere's land, and the amount of people. Like I I had a friend of mine um, who teaches in Burlington. And I did this show every night at 10 o'clock. I did it from my house here in Renfrew. And um, we sh- he shows up, he comes back to Renfrew. He's my high school buddy. And he goes, I got to tell you a story. I was in my class and I was sharing this story about something you and I did when we were in high school. 
And he goes, when I tell the story, because my name's John, I always refer to you as John Paul. And uh, at the end of the class, this kid came up and he was really shy. And he goes, Mr. Coltsman, you said John Paul. And he goes, yeah. He goes, is that the guy from the radio? And he goes, yeah, he's on, he's on the radio. He's my buddy. He goes, I want to tell you something. I play water polo. And every, every night uh, that I go to practice, my dad picks me up. And when I get in the car, he looks at me and he says, you're not allowed to talk until John's done talking. Because I want to hear what he has to say. <laughs> Don't talk to me till we till he's done talking. And like, I was like, isn't that a, like, I mean, that's a crazy thing that this friend I have in high school has a student in high school in another yeah. part of the province that has a dad that's sitting in a parking lot waiting for his son. And he's thinking about something like you're saying, and that's the power. And that's 10 o'clock on a Thursday night on an AM radio station that everyone says is dead. And it, yeah. ain't. it just ain't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I hope that someone harnesses that power and does good with it because there's just so much good stuff happening. Yeah. Good stuff. That's a great story. Yeah. John, it's a real pleasure chatting with you. Thanks very much for taking the time. Thanks, Ted. All the best. That'll do it for another edition of the Ted Wallace and podcast. Thank you all for tuning in and hope you'll do it again next week. If you've uh, missed any episodes you'd like to, uh, Catch up on, go to www.tedwalloshin, that's W-O-L-O-S-H-Y-N dot C-A, and you can catch up on past episodes, leave your comments and your thoughts and uh, any suggestions that you might have for uh, future guests. We've had that happen in the past, and we appreciate that as well. And in the meantime, if you're online, fill out your organ and tissue donation card. You could change or even save a life. In the meantime, have a great week. The Ted Wallachian Podcast has been brought to you by Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And ETP Canada, providing estate administration with ease. The Ted Wallachian Podcast is produced by me, Becky Coles. Technical production by Paul Gatt. Music by Bike Thieves. For more information on this podcast and our sponsors, and to talk to Ted, go to www.tedwallishan.ca.